just who was Joseph of Arimathea. All four of the Gospel writers include him in their narrative describing the crucifixion of Messiah Jesus. He's there for a couple of verses, and then, just as quickly, he disappears from the story. Through the centuries, elaborate legends have been built up around him. This presentation will not discuss those. The stories about him traveling to Britain with a young boy Jesus, about his connection with the Grail legend, or how the Grail is actually the burial shroud now housed in Turin. There is simply no support for these topics in any of the Gospels, or even hinted at at the rest of the New Testament. Instead, we will examine what actual evidences there are in the Gospels. We will discover exactly why this individual could suddenly appear and be given the possession of the corpse of Jesus to do with it as he pleased. We will investigate the location of Arimathea, a city some experts say is supposedly lost to history. We will solve one of the biggest mysteries of the New Testament, the supposed corruption of the genealogy found in Matthew. And how do the assigned jobs for the Levitical priests described in the Old Testament lead us to uncover a reveal about Mary, the mother of Jesus, something no one has yet recognized in modern church history? Let's begin by examining what the Bible says about who was Joseph of Arimathea. Ignore all the fanciful tradition and assumptions and legends. What does the biblical text actually say? Matthew 27, 57. Now, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea, named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. Mark 15.43 Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent council member, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. And he gathered up courage and went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Luke 23.50-52 And behold, a man named Joseph, who was a council member, a good and righteous man, he had not consented to their counsel and action. A man from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who was waiting for the kingdom of God, this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And finally, John 19.38. Now, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Each gospel narrative gives us various information about him. If we consider that the order of the gospels is the order in which they were written, then the details are further increased as time goes on. The very first thing that is said about him in the New Testament is that he was wealthy. He was a rich man. Matthew continues by saying that Joseph had become a converted disciple of Jesus. Mark adds that he was not just well-known, but honorable, of recognized moral quality. He was a member of the ruling council of Jerusalem. However, he was waiting for the kingdom of God, one of the main messages throughout the ministry of Jesus. These facts would have stood in stark contrast for Mark's readers, as they would have been well aware of the failings of the majority of the religious leaders. Luke also introduces him as a member of the ruling council. He states that he was good and righteous. Good is much more than just a statement about his character. His public reputation was considered honorable, worthy, and was of higher rank. But he's, he was said to be righteous, which speaks to his, mora to his morality. As evidence of this, Luke states that Joseph had not agreed with the decision and the actions of the council to execute Jesus. John does not mention Joseph being a member of the ruling council at all. He confirms that he was a committed follower, a follower of Jesus, but only in secret. He was afraid of the repercussions of this fact came, became public knowledge. 
This final fact, stated in the last gospel, demonstrates the jeopardy he faced, and it was no small decision to approach Pilate. We usually refer to him as Joseph of Arimathea. We very quickly gloss over what this actual me actually means. It has to be stated that this was not his actual name. Only in two of the Gospels is he even referred to in this manner, in Mark and John. Matthew and Luke include from Arimathea separately as part of their list of several adjectives which describe who he was. However, the Greek text do not capture an interesting detail which is found in the Aramaic version of Mark and John. As with other presentations, I bring up the Aramaic text in comparison with the Greek text. The lingua franca of the Roman Empire was Greek, and therefore the Greek version went west. However, the lingua franca to the east was Aramaic through that entire area. The New Testament text in Aramaic was in, it was in existence during the early period of the church as well. It's very helpful to examine because it's closer to the common language that was spoken by Jesus and his disciples. So let's look at John 11 verse 18 as an example. John specifies Lazarus being from Bethany. It's the most basic preposition saying where he was from. However, in Mark 15.43 and John 19.38, it states it this way, Joseph, he who was of Arimathea. This Joseph needed to be differentiated from all other people named Joseph, differentiated from the Joseph who was the husband of Mary. Now the question is, why? Why would both of these writers need to make sure that everyone understood that this was a different Joseph, different from the one who was, adop who was the adopted and legal father of Jesus? John includes a detail which hints at why Joseph of Arimathea had to quickly jump into action and reveal that he was indeed a disciple to Jesus. Then the Jews because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. John 19.31 According to Roman literature and records, usually the bodies of those on the cross were left to rot and be eaten by the birds. However, the Jewish leaders did not want any of the three bodies executed that day to remain on their crosses. The start of the Sabbath was fast approaching, and it was a special Sabbath, the first day of unleavened bread. They wanted to make sure they were taken down, more accurate rendering, rendering than taken away. But what exactly was the rush? According to the Law of Moses, God commanded that the criminals be buried the same day. And if a man has committed a sin, the judgment of which is death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his corpse shall not hang all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day, because cursed of God is he who is hanged, so that you do not make unclean your land which Yahweh your God has given you as an inheritance. That's in Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 to 23. If they did not bury the bodies by the time the Feast of Unleavened Bread began, the entire land would be unclean, and they would not be able to perform the prescribed rituals of that feast. This was one of the major festivals of the Jewish religious year, and Jerusalem was packed with pilgrims from all over Judea and beyond. This would have led to an even bigger scandal than it already was if the bodies were left up for the entire population to see. But that was just an excuse. Their real intention was to have control of the corpse. This is evident later in the narrative when the leaders meet privately with Pilate. Matthew 27, 63-64 They said, Sir, we, rem we remember that he was still, when he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I am to rise again. Therefore, order the grave 
to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come and steal him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. Jesus died around 3 p.m. The next day, the Sabbath, started at sundown, sometime after 6.30 to 7 p.m. There was not much time in order to rescue the body before the Jewish leaders had the bodies removed and had control of them. Joseph, the one from Arimathea, decided to act. He was a disciple of Jesus, but in secret. He most likely feared for his position in the ruling council. However, he had already begun to make firm, to take a firm stand, and had not agreed with the decision and actions of his fellow council members. And Luke 23, 51 tells us this. He had not consented to their counsel and action, a man from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who was waiting for the kingdom of God. Mark 15, 43, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent council member who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God, and he gathered up courage and went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. What did he do? He approached Pilate on his own. He gathered courage. This was not something that he was comfortable with or used to doing. But what right did he have to even ask for the body of Jesus? Did he come on behalf of the Sanhedrin? He had not agreed with their initial actions, so he could not have claimed official business. There was only one reason, by law, that someone could claim the body of an executed criminal. This is described by Opinius, as is found in the enactments of Justinian. The bodies of those who are condemned to death should not be refused their relatives. And the divine Augustus, in the tenth book on his life, said that this rule had been observed. At present, the body of those who have been punished are, though, are only buried when this has been requested and permission granted. And sometimes it is not permitted, especially where persons have been convicted of high treason. Even the bodies of those who have been sentenced to be burned can be claimed in order that their bones and ashes, after have been collected, may be buried. The body could only be claimed by family. And Pilate wondered if he had been die if, if he had died by this time and summoning the centurion he questioned him as to whether he already died and ascertaining from this from the centurion he granted the body to joseph mark 15 44 to 45 the word wondered does not express the right sense of the original word he didn't wonder if jesus had died he was amazed that jesus was already dead the method of crucifixion could be a long and torturous way to die. That's why Pilate had to confirm with the centurion that he was already dead. When it was confirmed, Joseph was granted permission to have the body. Based on the rites with, with which Joseph of Arimathea presented in order to claim the body, the right that he was related to the deceased, according to Roman law. <clears throat> Joseph immediately buys a linen cloth, takes down the body from the cross, wraps it in linen, and places it in the nearby tomb. It was his own recently completed tomb, Matthew 27, 60, and laid it in his own tomb, which he had hewn out from the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. It was in a garden near where Jesus had been crucified. Now in the place where he had crucified, he, had, he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. John 19, 41. Mary, Jesus' mother, was watching all this take place from across the tomb. Mark 15, 43, or 47. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were looking on to see where he had been laid. Joseph was the half-brother of Jesus through Mary, as it states in Mark. Is this man not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joses, and Judas, and Simon? And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting, sitting opposite the grave. Matthew 27, 61. 
Through the only provision allowed by Roman law, the body of Jesus had been granted to his family. The Jewish leaders became aware of this, and immediately they go to Pilate. How do we know this? Matthew 27, 62. Now on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered with Pilate. It was on the next day. The Jewish calendar considers the start of each day at the point when evening begins, after sundown. We see this in Genesis 1 verse 5. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. Evening, morning, is the cycle of each day. Evening is the start of the day in Jewish culture. The chief priests and Pharisees went after sundown at the start of the next day, the Sabbath. They wanted the tomb to be officially sealed for three days. They knew full well what Jesus had said, and they took it to be three literal 24-hour periods. So this was not the next morning after dawn. Otherwise, they would have asked for only two and a half days, not three complete days. Pilate tells them to secure the tomb the cells. So they set up Jewish guards and placed a seal on the stone at the entrance of the tomb. Matthew 27, 66. And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard they sent they set a seal on the stone. There is no more mention of Joseph of Arimathea after this. His purpose was complete. The body of Jesus had been prevented from ending up in the possession of the Jewish leaders and dumped into an unmarked grave. The body had been made secure and protected from harm for the promised literal three days and three nights. It is just as Jesus prophesied multiple times when he was alive. But then, who was Joseph of Arimathea? If he was related to Jesus, does the Bible provide more information? Many people have searched, but admit there is nothing more than can, that can be learned within the text. However, I disagree. There is actually some very surprising information that most people are not aware of. For this, we have to investigate exactly where Arimathea was located. When you investigate this topic, it is surprising to learn that some scholars say that no one knows where Arimathea was, that it is a city lost to history. It's hard to understand this. Is it, beca is it because people try to find a modern city called Arimathea? If so, that's correct. There is no modern city with this exact name. Do they not realize that Arimathea is the anglicized version of the Greek name? That there would not be a Jewish city with that particular name in Greek? One has to investigate what was the Hebrew version of the Greek name, which the English translators transliterated as Arimathea. Arimathea is referenced as Strong's G707. It's transliterated Har Armathia. It lists the Hebrew origin as Strong's 7414, Rama, meaning the height, usually with the article the, as in Ha Rama. Let's take a look at what the Aramaic says. Aramaic was the lingua franca of the Jews and of all Mesopotamia during that period and after. Look in the Aramaic New Testament, the Peshitta. It's Ramtha, hill or mountain, or Ha Ramtha. We can see how the Greek transliterated the Aramaic to get Ha Ramathia. There were several towns or villages with this name, but there is only one that is mentioned the vast majority of times within the biblical text. The location of this town is five miles or eight kilometers northeast from Jerusalem. It's walking distance. This particular fact will become very important as we continue. In order to determine the exact location and get a bearing of the geography, we have to examine the promised land as it was divided during the time of Joshua. The geography was referred to in a very specific manner throughout the history of the Bible. 
First, look at the land inheritance of the tribe of Ephraim. In Joshua 16, verse 1. <clears throat> then the lot for the sons of Joseph went out from the Jordan at Jericho to the waters of Jericho to the east into the wilderness, going up from Jericho through the hill country to Bethel. Here, Jericho is the low point. But as one, as one goes west toward Bethel, there is the mention of the hill country. The inheritance for Benjamin was to the south of Ephraim. Joshua 18, 11, and 12. Now the lot of the tribe of the sons of Benjamin came up according to their families, and the territory of their lot lay between the sons of Judah and the sons of Joseph. And their border on the north side was from the Jordan. Then the border went up to the side of Jericho on the north and went up through the hill country westward. And it ended at the wilderness of beth -Aven. Here again the low point is Jericho. And as it went west, it went through the hill country into the wilderness. The cities of Benjamin included the listed in Joshua 18, 21 to 22, 25, and 28. Now the cities of the tribe of the sons of Benjamin, according to their families, were Jericho and Bethel, Gibeon, and Ramah, and the Jebusite, that is, Jerusalem. Notice Ramah and Jerusalem are located very close together. Now Judges 4, verse 5, And she used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah, between Ramah and Bethlehem, or Bethel, sorry, in the hill country of Ephraim. And the sons of Israel came up to her for judgment. Deborah, one of the judges, lived near Ramah. He was in the hill country of Ephraim. The next time Ramah is mentioned, it is in the narrative of Samuel, the prophet. Now there was a certain man from Ramathaim, Zophim, from the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah. 1 Samuel 1 verse 1. This Ramathaim, Zophim, is the same as Ramah. It was the home of Samuel. This is stated later in verse 19. Then they arose early in the morning and worshipped before Yahweh, and turned back and came to their house in Ramah. This long form of the city name is very similar to the later Greek transliteration, Hamarathiah. Strong's H7436 lists the meaning as double height of the watchers. Those that understand who the watchers were, the offspring of the fallen angels, angels and human women, see in this name a very interesting piece of information. These watchers were said to be of double height. Twice the height of a man? Next, let's look at a genealogy found in 1 Chronicles. This is during the time of Solomon. These are those who stood for service with their sons, from the sons of the Kohathites. And it lists a bunch of names and includes Samuel, the son of Elkanah. And it says he was the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, the son of Israel. Samuel the prophet is stated to be of the, of the tribe of Levi. He was of the priestly line. Further, he was a descendant of Kohath, a Kohathite. The Levites were divided into families with very specific priestly duties and inheritance, as it states in Numbers 7, verses 6 and 9. So Moses took the carts and the oxen and gave them to the Levites. But he did not give any to the sons of Kohath, because theirs was the service of the holy objects which they carried on their shoulder. The Kohathites had the responsibility of the holy objects in the tabernacle, later in the temple, objects such as the Ark of the Covenant, candlesticks, among other things. And the leader of the father's households of the Kohathite families was Elaphan, the son of Azel. Now their responsibility involved the Ark, the table, the lampstand, the altars, and the utensils of the sanctuary which they minister, and the screen, and all the service concerning them. Numbers 3. 30 to 31. When the Israelites entered the promised land, all the tribes received land as their inheritance, all, that is, except the Levites. The tribe of the Levites 
received cities throughout all the land of the inheritance of all the other tribes. The Kohathites were assigned cities from the tribe of Judah, Simeon, Benjamin, Ephraim, Dan, and Manasseh. This is listed in Joshua 21 verses 4 and 5. Then the lot came out for the families of the Kohathites, and the sons of Aaron the priest, who were of the Levites, received thirteen cities by the lot, from the tribe of Judah, and from the tribe of the Simeonites, and from the tribe of Benjamin. Now the rest of the sons of Kohath received ten cities by the lot from the families of the tribe of Ephraim, and from the tribe of Dan, and from the half-tribe of Manasseh. The, the specific cities from Benjamin were from the tribe of Benjamin, Gibeon with its pasture lands, Geba with its pasture lands, Anathoth with its pasture lands, and Ammon with its pasture lands, four cities. These were the cities given specifically for the Kohathite priest families to live. Notice that Ramah was very near to all these four cities. Now, this is a lot of geography and history and might seem like pointless information. But believe me, there is a very important reason I'm boring you with all these details. Something that I don't think anyone in modern times has noticed before, at least from what I can determine. So stick with me as we continue. What have we determined? There actually was a town called Arimathea. This name is based on the Greek transliteration of the Aramaic ha ram -tha. This is the same as the ancient Hebrew name of Ramathayim Rilzophim, which was shortened to Ramah. This city was located in the hill country, which was west of Jericho and north of Jerusalem. The Kohathites, a part of the priestly tribe of Levi, had four cities and associated villages which were nearby. Samuel, a Kohathite of the tribe of Levi, lived in Ramah. During the time of Jesus, Joseph lived in this town of Ramah or Arimathea, which is very close to Jerusalem. As a council member of the Sanhedrin, he was in close proximity to the life and politics of that capital city. So now we know where Arimathea was, and we need to, to uh, explore that other supposition. We need that how he was related to Jesus. Only a family member could could petition the Roman governor for the body of the executed. For this investigation, we have to go to the very beginning of the New Testament, to the beginning of Matthew, to the genealogy. The very first thing that the first gospel introduces us to is a genealogy of Messiah Jesus. Many people consider this boring and quickly move past it. However, those that do investigate it and count up the names find a big problem in the very first verses of the New Testament. Matthew states very clearly that there are three sets of 14 names that make up the genealogy. Matthew 1, verse 17. Therefore, all the gen generations from Af to Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the deportation of Babylon are 14 generations. And from the deportation of Babylon to Christ are 14 generations. There are 14 names in the first and second sets. But with the way the majority of English translations present it, the third set only includes 13 generations. This has been a major stumbling block for Christians and scholars for centuries. It's not just in the English, however. This problem was noticed in the Greek text in earlier centuries, and there is a set of manuscripts that try to, to resolve this problem by inserting a name into the genealogy so that it does read as 14 generations. That might solve the apparent issue in Matthew, but it has no historical support from the Old Testament records. Matthew 1.16 And Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who was called Christ. The text seems to present the genealogy as through Joseph, the husband of Mary. However, there is a very big problem with this, for those that know there is another gene uh, genealogy in Luke's Gospel. Luke 3.23 When he began his ministry, Jesus was himself about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, and so it continues. 
Luke starts his genealogy specifically with the adopted father of Jesus, that is, Joseph. It presents names through an entirely different son of King David. There is no other way to interpret this, so there is an apparent contradiction. And that's been a huge stumbling block for people for centuries. People have used this contradiction to throw out the entire New Testament. Let's take a much closer look at the words used in Matthew and see if we can determine something which very few have recognized. There are two verses in the first chapter of Matthew with where Jesus, sorry, where Joseph is said to be Mary's husband. One occurs in the genealogy of Matthew 1.16. And Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, who, by whom Jesus was born, who was called Christ. Then, another few verses later in verse 19, And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. The Greek text uses the same word in both places. That is the word aner, which is Strong's G435. It is commonly used to mean husband or betrothed as a future husband. It is translated this way 50 times in the New Testament, but it is also very often used to describe a male in general, that is, any male. It is translated this way over 150 times. Most consider the Greek of the New Testament as the original text, but few recognize that there was also a very ancient version of the New Testament text in Aramaic that existed during that same period of the early church. With Greek as the lingua franca in the Roman Empire, the Greek New Testament went west. However, the Aramaic was the lingua franca of Mesopotamia and east of the Roman Empire, the Parthian Empire, and the New Testament in Aramaic went east. Very few examine how the Aramaic Peshitta renters this text to see if there are any unrecognized clues. The Aramaic word used in Matthew 1, 6, 1, 16 is gara. It is used specifically for a male as opposed to a female, a strong male, and can be used to refer to a husband, but not exclusively. In many places throughout the Aramaic New Testament, this word is used to describe a generic man. This is very similar to the Greek word aner, which we just examined. In just one example of, ma of many, Matthew 7 verse 9, Or what man is there among you, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? But just a few verses later in verse 19, the Aramaic text uses a completely different word. Where the Greek text uses the same word in both instances, the Aramaic uses two completely different words. Here is the word bala. It is used very specifically for husband, lord, master. So this raises the question, why does the text use her man in verse 16, and then only a few verses later uses her husband or master? The Greek text uses the same word in both places, and this leads to the assumption that both words mean the same thing. The Aramaic, however, seems to need to make a differentiation for some reason. Is it possible that there are two different people being described? That there are two different men named Joseph in Mary's life? In verse 19, the context is very definitely referring to the Joseph who was betrothed to Mary, who later she wed. But the earlier verse, as part of the genealogy, is actually describing Mary's lineage. Here, Matthew is listing the genealogy of Mary, but the genealogy in Luke is very specifically that of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Now we see the clue of the supposedly missing person in Matthew's final list. There is actually no missing person after all. Jacob, the father of Joseph, the man of Mary, by whom Jesus was born. But what exactly does the man of Mary even mean? 
There are some who have recognized the two different Aramaic words describing two different Josephs in Matthew's first chapter. They have suggested that the first is describing a Joseph who was the father of Mary. However, I don't think that that is consistent with the rest of the genealogy. Throughout the entire long list, the verb to bear or begat is used consistently for all the generations. If Joseph was the father of Mary, that same word, verb, would have been used. Joseph begat Mary. But it specifically says, Joseph, the man of Mary. An additional detail must be recognized. Matthew does not present a biologically complete list of ancestors. He is laying out the legal credentials of how Jesus had the right to be called the Messiah. Other scholars have recognized that there are actually missing names earlier in Matthew's genealogy. When these missing names are investigated, one discovers that these people were cursed by God for their evil deeds and were pruned from the family tree. They legally lost their rights to be included in the lineage of the Jewish Messiah. So this particular Joseph, as the man of Mary, was not her father. Instead, the usage of the word implies that he was her protector and legal guardian. It could be that Mary's father had died and that one of her close male relatives took on the responsibility of Mary as his adopted daughter. This is the Hebrew concept of kinsman redeemer. The book of Ruth is chiefly concerned with this very topic, and it could very well be that its main purpose for being included in the biblical canon was to foreshadow a similar situation in the life of Mary and her mother. If this in fact is the case, then the appearance of Joseph of Arimathea during the crucifixion narrative now makes complete sense. Many have no noticed that Joseph, the husband of Mary, is not present after the trip to Jerusalem when Jesus was 12 years old. He is not mentioned in the narrative again as living. Therefore, if the adopted father of Jesus was not present to legally claim the body, that would mean another relative would have to do it instead. Joseph of Arimathea, the guardian of Mary, as a blood relative, did take action and approached Pilate to claim the body. Therefore, it would seem that the genealogy of Mary does indeed contain three sets of 14 names just as claimed. Within a few verses of each other, there are two different people both named Joseph. The Aramaic text, which uses two different words, prove that this must be the case. But the Greek text allows for both of these different meanings using the same word. So this has not been noticed when people read the text in Greek. And obviously no English translation has recognized this difference either. This could very well be the origin of the tradition for Christians of the East, who believe Joseph of Arimathea was Mary's uncle. The Aramaic New Testament that they commonly use has this very clear difference in meaning. It would be obvious to them and to make this conclusion. There is still more evidence that suggests that Joseph of Arimathea was related to Mary, the mother of Jesus. As far as I'm aware, no one else has published this research before. I was absolutely amazed when I first discovered this. Now obviously, there is nowhere in the New Testament that explicitly states this fact. The connection will become evidence as we consider several further details given in the narratives. Whenever I had read through these particular statements before, they seemed like throwaway details. But now I realize why the writers included what they did. First, let's examine the narrative of the birth of John the Baptizer. Luke sets the stage in Luke 1 verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Zechariah was a priest. Only those of the tribe of Levi could be priests. 
In addition, Elizabeth was also from the tribe of Levi and specifically a descendant of Aaron. Later in the chapter, it is stated that Elizabeth was related to Mary. Luke 1 verse 36, And behold, your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who was called barren. As we've discovered, Matthew's genealogy presents Mary's lineage. It is listed through the males of the family. Mary was descended through King David and was of the tribe of Judah. Therefore, if Elizabeth was related to Mary through the tribe of Levi, then this must have been on Mary's mother's side. Mary's mother was then also a daughter of Aaron. That means that Mary herself was a daughter of Aaron. This particular detail becomes important when examining what is stated in 1 Chronicles 23, verse 13. The sons of Amram were Aaron and Moses, and Aaron was separated in order to sanctify him as holy, he and his sons forever, to offer offerings up in smoke before Yahweh, to minister to him and to bless in his name forever. All of the descendants of Aaron were separated as special. They were responsible to make offerings to God, both in incense and in blessings. They were set apart to minister to God. How much more personal was this ministry by Mary, a daughter of Aaron, whose hands ministered to the very flesh of the Incarnation himself? This takes on unrecognized extra significance when considering Mary's Magnificat, her song of blessing to the Lord. Luke 1, 46-49, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has looked upon the humble state of his slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Mary's song is patterned after another woman's spontaneous song of praise. This is the song of Hannah when she, was, when she received the answer to her prayer and gave birth to Samuel. Remember that earlier we learned that Hannah was also a tribe, uh, was also of the tribe of Levi, a daughter of Aaron. 1 Samuel 2, 1 to 2. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart exults in Yahweh, for my horn is exalted in Yahweh. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies, because I am glad in your salvation. There is no one holy like Yahweh. Indeed, there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. For the next truly amazing discovery, we have to in investigate the throwaway detail that states Zechariah was of the division of Abijah. That's found in Luke 1 verse 5. During the time of King David, at the end of his life, he began organizing for the construction of the temple. He divided the Levites into groups, basically shifts. Each would operate and minister at the temple for a set period of time, and they all had very particular responsibilities. As is stated in 1 Chronicles 23, verse 6, And David divided them into divisions according to the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. We've already taken a look at verse 13 of this chapter, but now it's time to include the previous verse, verse 12. The sons of Kohath, Amram, Izar, Hebron, and Uzziel, four. The sons of Amram were Aaron and Moses, and Aaron was separated in order to sanctify him as most holy, he and his sons forever, to offer offerings up in smoke before Yahweh, to minister to him and to bless in his name forever. Aaron's father was Amram, whose father was Kohath. All the descendants of Amram were Kohathites. The sons of Aaron were further organized into 24 groups. Now the divisions of the sons of Aaron were these. The sons of Aaron were, and it lists all these people. But notice that the eighth was Abijah. These were their assignments for their service, which they came in to the house of Yahweh according to the legal judgment rendered to them by the hand of Aaron their father, just as Yahweh, the God of Israel, had commanded them. 
24 groups in total. Abijah was the name of one of the groups. Each of these served during a particular period during the year, and they were all set apart to serve within the temple itself. Luke 1 verse 5 states that Zechariah was of the division of Abijah. Later in the narrative, this is why Zechariah was serving in the temple and performing very specific duties. Luke 1 verse 8 and 9. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly service, or avis, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. Only in the lineage of Aaron could Zechariah serve within the sanctuary and burn incense. And further, this means that both Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth were descendants of Kohath. They were Kohathites. After John the Baptizer is conceived, the angel Gabriel visits Mary in Nazareth. As part of the history-changing news that she, would give to, that she would give birth to the Messiah, he states that Elizabeth, her relative, was with child. Luke 1, verse 39. Now, at this time, Mary arose and went in hurry to the hill country to the city of Judah, to a city of Judah. Once John's birth had occurred, it caused quite a buzz throughout the entire area. And Luke 1 verse 65 says, And fear came on all those living around them, and all these matters were being talked about all in the hill country of Judea. Both of these verses describe where Zechariah and Elizabeth lived. They were in Judea and in an area known as the Hill Country. We've come across this phrase before. It described the area north of Jerusalem and west of Jericho, an area given to the tribe of Benjamin, an area with four cities, specifically given to the priestly descendants of the Kohathites, the same family that Zechariah and Elizabeth descended from, the area which included the village of Ramah, or Hamratha. Now we begin to see the connections of all these various strands. Mary hurries to visit her relatives, who live in the hill country. These relatives are on her mother's side. However, on her father's side, she is still under the guardianship of a man named Joseph. This was Joseph of Arimathea, of ha Ramtha, the very same place. Mary's mother's relatives and Mary's father's relatives lived in the same area. This is why she bases her song of blessing on the song of Hannah. Hannah was also from Ramah, and also a daughter of Aaron, also a Kohathite. It is very likely that Mary herself was from Arimathea. There is one last piece of evidence to investigate. This is found in the narrative of the birth of Jesus described in Matthew. It's also one of those passages that don't quite seem to fit in, until now. Matthew 2, 17-18 Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she was refusing to be comforted because they were no more. Matthew quotes this as fulfilled prophecy when Herod gives orders to kill all the male babies under two years of age. This slaughter occurs in Bethlehem and the surrounding area. What does this have to do with Ramah? Bethlehem is south of Jerusalem. Ramah is north of Jerusalem. For the answer, we have to examine Rachel, the wife of Jacob. Centuries before there was a nation of Israel, the entourage of Jacob was traveling south through Canaan. Genesis 35, 16-20 Then they journeyed from Bethel, and there was still some distance to go to Ephrath. And Rachel, was, was, and Rachel gave birth, and she suffered severely in her labor. Now it happened that when she was in severe labor, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for now you have another son. Now it happened as her soul was departing, or she died, that she named him Benoni, but his father named him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a, a pillar over her grave, 
That is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. They were headed south to Bethlehem when they left Bethel. It says they were still some distance away. That would imply that they were not nearby. The modern site of Rachel's tomb near Bethlehem cannot possibly be accurate. They were still less than halfway there. That would imply they were still north of what would later be called Jerusalem in the hill country. Rachel gave birth to Beth but to Benjamin. This is why the tribe of Benjamin received the land it did, the area where Rachel died giving birth. 1 Samuel 10 verse 2 gives us even more detailed information. Samuel lived in Ramah and instructed Saul. 1 Samuel 10 verse 2. When you go for me today, then you will find two men close to Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin in Zelzah. This is how Rachel and Ramah are connected. Rachel's tomb was nearby Ramah. Is this the reason why Matthew includes the passage as a fulfillment of prophecy? He connects Bethlehem as the birthplace of the Messiah with Ramah as the birthplace of Mary. Is this a subtle and previously unrecognized indirect evidence? There have been some wide-ranging topics discussed throughout this presentation. I said this would be the case. If the Bible contained simple statements about these matters, then there would be not, then there not be the questions that there have been throughout the centuries. It requires a deep dive into seemingly unconnected passages. To review, Joseph, the one from Arimathea, did not approach Pilate because he was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He claimed the body of Jesus because he had the right under, under Roman law. He was a family member of the one executed. Since he must have been related, was it through the father's or the mother's side? There are two genealogies listed in the New Testament. As we've seen, one describes the father's side, the one recorded in Luke, and the one describes the mother's side, the one recorded in Matthew. Here is where Joseph of Arimathea fits in. He is the Joseph said to be the man of Mary. This according to the particular words found in the Aramaic text. This solves the apparent issue that the last set of names seems to only have 13 generations listed. But there are actually 14 generations, just as Matthew states. Joseph was not Mary's father, but he was most likely her guardian. Something probably happened to her father, and Joseph must have been the closest male relative as the kinsman redeemer of Mary's mother. Arimathea as the place was not lost to history. It was the Greek transliteration of the, of the Aramaic Ha Ramtha and Hebrew Rama, which was shortened from the version of Ramathayim Zophim. This town was located eight kilometers north of Jerusalem and west of Jericho in the hill country. It was the area of Levite inheritance, specifically of the Kohathites, those descended from Koath. This town was where Samuel and his mother were from. Nearby was the, was the tomb of Rachel, where she died giving birth to Benjamin. It was very likely the hometown of Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. Elizabeth must have been Mary's aunt on her mother's side. That made Mary a daughter of Aaron, of the priestly line. But she was also a descendant of King David through her father's side. Mary likely grew up in Arimathea. While it is fantastic to discover all these amazing details which many do not know, all of this does not serve all of this does serve a greater purpose. As I have mentioned a couple of times, the various mysteries and seeming contradictions have caused many to doubt the veracity of the Bible throughout the centuries. To some, there have these have proved to be such a stumbling block that they have thrown out the entire Christianity completely. But those who have investigated these areas and haven't found any acceptable solutions have had to take the Bible on faith and that there does exist some way to make sense of the text, even though it was not evident. 
Finally, here are the answers provided that treat the text respectfully and are historically and culturally accurate. The genealogy in Matthew is accurate as written, but the words as they are usually translated are wrong. I think this is the biggest takeaway from this presentation. There is now almost 2,000 years of church tradition. Some of what we have come to believe is based on ignorance, misreadings, and resistance to honestly investigate topics because of stubborn ego. We often defer to supposed experts. We miss out on the pure joy of discovering the intricate details of God's Word, some of which are still hidden to this day. Proverbs 25 verse 2 It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter.